Well, we are in the very last chapter of 1 Corinthians. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And so I was just counting the number of sermons. We've had 34. This is the 34th sermon from the book of 1 Corinthians. So we've taken almost a year and a half to go through this book. And uh, we praise God for his word, for his training, for his instructions for our life. So please turn with me into 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And we will go through the whole chapter today, but we will break it down into portions. So first, I would like to, us to read from verses 1 to 4. So the title of my sermon today is Conclusion and Exhortation. Let's read. Please follow with me as I read from verses 1 to 4. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gifts to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. Father, we pray that, Lord, as we sit at your feet, help us, Lord, to be attentive. Lord, I pray that... Uh, Lord, we'll allow your word to speak to us, correct us, and uh, encourage us, empower us. I pray that, Lord, revelation will take place in our lives. Transformational revelation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So now here Paul is now bringing the entire letter of uh, 1 Corinthians that he's written to the church in Corinth. He's bringing it to a close with this chapter. He starts with, uh, with this sentence, now about, whenever he says now about, it, is in, it means that he's responding to a question that was sent in a letter from the Corinthian church to him. And they asked for clarification about so many things, about, about marriage, about spiritual gifts, about, you know, uh, all, so many different subjects they wanted clarification. And so now he's talking about collection. Now, this is a specific collection. It's not to be misunderstood with tithes and offerings. This is a specific collection that is going to be sent to the church in Jerusalem because the church in Jerusalem was a very financially poor church. It was full of widows, and uh, it was financially not in a sound situation. So many churches showed their solidarity by sending, so we, we already know here Paul had instructed the Galatians to do and now he's instructing the Corinthians to do that so that it will be a blessing to the church in Jerusalem. The Bible teaches us to be generous, teaches us to minister to each other. I want to give you two warnings. Number one, the warning that there will be people who want to take advantage there are con men and con women even in the church. And you need a spirit of discernment. And so if you minister to the con men, you are actually fueling, fueling a bad habit. And so you and I need to be people of discernment to know who is a con man and where is the genuine need. At the same time, the other warning is many people have stopped being generous because sometime in their life, they were taken on a ride and they were cheated by a con man. I pray that you don't stop being generous and you should not stop ministering to genuine needs just because somebody has cheated you in the past and it has hurt you. However, I want to encourage you to grow in the grace of God and the only way that you can discern is spiritual discernment and spiritual discernment is a gift that the Holy Spirit gives. And so the, our discernment will always be in proportion to our closeness and our surrender to God. The more we are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, the more he has control in our lives. Because God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on us. He always works with us up to the area we allow him to work. He does not work with us beyond that. He cannot. He respects his own word. 
And that's why he says in, book of, in the book of Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. If anyone opens his door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. It's not a word to the unbeliever. That's a word to the believer. He's telling the church. Why? Because we all have the freedom of how much of exposure that we want to give of ourselves to God. The more we surrender, the more he works with us. And that's where I see the relevance of a prayer like the prayer of Jabez in the Old Testament when he says, Lord, expand my territories. Jabez was not praying for more wealth. He was not praying for more property. He was not praying for carnal desires. He was actually praying for godly influence in his life to expand so that that influence touches the lives of people around him. So this is a collection for specific reason. You know, we need to be disciplined. Uh, I, before that, let me just read Acts chapter 24, verse 17. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. And so this is an important thing. And then Paul says that this, like many other things, and like every other thing, that you need to do together as a church has to be done in an orderly manner. He says, on the first day, the first day is Sunday. Now, the Jewish day of worship was the Saturday, the Sabbath, the Saturday. But you find in the Bible, if you go to Acts chapter 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. Now, this is the incident where Brother Eutychus fell off the window of the third floor sleeping. So please, I want to caution you, don't sleep when, when the word of God is being preached, because you may end up dying or doing something embarrassing <laughs> and, you know, while you sleep as the word is being preached. At least pinch yourself. If the, if the sermon is boring, pinch yourself to stay awake. So he says, Be, do this in an orderly fashion. So they mess, met on the first day of the week. So what happened is that Christian believers started meeting on the first day of the week. Why? Because, why on the first day? That's a Sunday. It's because that was the day of the resurrection of Jesus. So that day became important to the Christians and started meeting on a Sunday. So Paul is saying that whenever you meet, now be disciplined, be orderly. And do it in proportion to the income that you have. So first of all, I want you to understand that Christian life is a life of discipline. You know, when Jesus gave us a commission, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. He did not say, go make followers of me. Why did Jesus specifically say he wants us to make disciples is because all disciples are followers, but not all followers are disciples. Because followers can follow Jesus with different motives. Some follow to see miracles. Some follow to receive healing. Some follow to eat food. Some follow just to, because they like to hear Jesus speak. Different reasons. But disciples follow with one intention. I want to please my master. I want to be like my master. I want me, myself, to die and him to be alive in me. I want to be like my master. And so from the word disciple comes the word discipline. And the modern day Christians have abdicated the whole area of discipline. We come to feel good. We come to tickle our carnal desires. And the moment our carnal desires are not tickled, the moment there is correction, there is rebuke, there is discipline, we get offended. But the word of God teaches us the complete love of God, which is rooted in the holiness of God, that the same merciful, gracious, loving Heavenly Father is the same one who loves us enough to correct us, to rebuke us, to train us in righteousness, and to demand of us do you know that God is demanding? 
You know, we have soft pedaled over the years. When I say we, I'm not talking about the Lighthouse Church alone. I'm talking about the church around the world. The modern day church has soft pedaled the gospel of Jesus. We stop at one message. It is a true message, but we stop at that. We only present Jesus as our savior. And that is good because we need a savior. We need a ministry in our life. But the problem of stopping at that point is that we grow up with a childish mentality that God is the universal giver and I, my only job is to receive and to receive and to receive. There is nothing I need to give. So if we stop at the message of Jesus as Savior, we present him only as a Savior, we will only be able to talk about unconditional love. We will only be able to talk about the grace of God and of faith. But the moment we take the next step and say, and preach Jesus as Lord, the picture turns. Because a Lord comes from the mentality of a master and a slave. That's where the terminology comes from. So the moment we recognize that, yes, I need a savior, my savior gave himself for me, but now he returns in return from me. From that moment, we become partners in giving and Lord becomes the receiver. He starts receiving our obedience he starts, we start giving our obedience and he starts receiving our obedience. We start giving him our devotion and he starts receiving our devotion. We stop becoming just recipients. We now start becoming givers because the price with which we are purchased is an expensive price and it is a demanding price. Jesus demands of you. And so we have grown up in church for years, but we have not grown in Christ because we have not understood the Lordship of Jesus. And the Lordship of Jesus demands. Now take it a step further. It's a, this is what brings everything into completion. And we start preaching Jesus as God. When we start preaching Jesus as God, that, that nails our coffin completely of self. Because then our whole worship belongs to him and worship always originates in the place of surrender, submission, and brokenness. Worship is a lifestyle where we put off and we put on. I've told you so many times, singing songs is not worship. That is an act, a tool that we use in a small expression of worship. But the real worship is obedience. The real worship is our lifestyle that reflects that truly we belong to Jesus. So we need to change that mindset that God keeps giving and we keep receiving. Because the moment we move from Jesus is Savior and we start preaching Jesus is Lord, we no longer talk about the unconditional love of God. We start talking about the conditional love of God. Do you, do, do you know that God's love is conditional? It is unconditional for the procurement of our salvation. He will wipe our slate clean, but from that moment, it is conditional. He demands obedience. He demands devotion. That beautiful hymn that says, it demands my life, demands my whole, demands me completely. We need to come into that place, church, of understanding. And we need to start. And that is true worship. Worship is not just feeling goosebumps and feeling good, worship is painful. Worship always is painful because you are giving up of self and you are giving in to God. It is demanding. And so he says, not only give in order, be disciplined about it, but also in proportion to one's income. We always try to check what is the other person giving and let me give in say, no. Your, your, how God is giving you your income is different. It's in different proportion, and that's why we need to learn to discipline ourselves. You know, one of the best discipline that we, we have to discipline every area of our life, and one of the areas that we need to discipline is financial discipline. Like in all other areas of your life, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. 
if you fail to plan, and why do you plan? A planning is always a stewardship role. The wealth that I have is not mine. It belongs to the Lord. I have it because he gave it to me. I'm a steward of it. So I need to find out what he wants me to do with this wealth. So I've said this many times. If your wallet is saved, you are truly saved. If your attitude to wealth is, because the Bible says, where your treasure is, there also is your heart. It doesn't say where your heart is, your treasure is, no. So if God is your priority, that is where your treasure will be. That is where you will invest time, energy, resources, talents, money, wealth. The priority of your life will be seen on how you spend your time, your energy, your money. These are the visible indicators of priority. Is God priority? Then you will find that all of this goes priority to God. So let us at least understand the fact that all that we have belongs to God and then have a sense of stewardship as we steward it. Let's read verses 6 to 9 now. Verses 5 to 9, sorry. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door of effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. So Paul shares about his plan to visit Corinth, but it's not just a casual visit. Wherever Paul visits, he wants to stay a while so that, so that he can leave impartation, godly impartation in that place. And he talks about the opportunity of ministry in Ephesus, and there was a revival happening in Ephesus. People were turning away from worship of Diana and Artemis and all the other gods and goddesses that were worshipped to the point that they stopped, they, they started having an effect on the on the business of the economy of the town because there was a thriving business of selling idols to worshippers who would come to these beautifully made temples. And so as people started getting saved and became Christians, they stopped buying these idols because they knew idol worship is, is a sin. And so the business of idol makers went down and so they started making opposition towards Paul. They started churning up, they started churning up a mob against Paul and, and his companions. And so there was struggle from within and struggle from without. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we face death daily on your behalf. I tell you, when you're called into ministry, which we all are called at different levels of responsibility, don't think that it is going to be a rosy, cushy, comfortable journey. The only promise that comes with it is, and lo, I am with you to the end of the ages. Jesus walks with us. His Holy Spirit is with us. He empowers us, anoints us. But does it mean that we will be comfortable? No. Why? Because everyone who, lives, who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's what the Bible teaches us. You see, you and I as Christians don't go looking for trouble. But by mere default of living out the gospel and preaching the gospel, we stir up trouble. Where is this trouble being stirred up? stirred up? It is being stirred up in the heavenly places of demonic realms because the influence that they have, the, the, the ownership that they have over the lives of people is being shaken, is being threatened. And so the demonic realm is not going to give up without a fight. So the moment you start sharing the gospel with someone, you know, we, we are unable to handle each other's egos right here in the, in the church and we get offended with each other here. Can you imagine a, a revival breaking out in this nation and you know who will come into this church at that time and the egos that will come here and the baggages that will come here? If you can't run with men, how are you going to run with horses, my dears? Think about it. We pray for revival, but revival comes at a cost. 
You know, the church that I was part of in Tanzania, it's called the Dar Salaam Pentecostal Church. We went as a church through a season of prayer. And we were located in a place geographically. On one side was a, it was a, was a wealthy kind of a, a middle class kind of society. And the other side was impoverished society. And all kind of things took place every day in the night. There were prostitutes lined up in front of the church compound doing their business. And as part of us as a church committing ourselves and breaking ourselves in the sight of God, what happened? A revival happened, and in a short time, thieves and thugs and drug addicts and these prostitutes got saved and they came into the church. And that's a good news. But the bad news, they came with their baggages. And all of a sudden, we had to deal with demonic stuff. We had to be, you know, there was tremendous work to be done. So revival always comes with a cost. Yes, pray for revival, but get yourself in order first. You know that the Lord is doing a shaking of the church here in Kuwait? You know why? Because God cannot allow his work to be represented by a weak church, by a church which is offended at the drop of a coin. God wants people who are ready to pay the price even unto death if need be. And so along with opportunities for ministries will come oppositions from inside and from outside. Because do you realize that as we are sitting right here, there are many who are not born again. They think they are. And you will see the fruit. And I pray that everyone comes to the saving knowledge in Christ and aligns yourself under the Lordship of Christ. So opposition will come from inside and opposition will come from outside. Praise God for that. You can read Acts chapter 19 where Paul faces such an opposition in Ephesus. Now let's go to verses 10 to 12. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Timothy was a disciple of Paul and like a dear son to him. And as you can make out from this verse, and if you go to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, the letter that Paul writes to Timothy, he, he can see how how dear Timothy was to Paul. And you can also make out how timid Timothy was. And that's why Paul tells Timothy, we have not been given a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control, of a sound mind. So Timothy was an introvert, was a very timid person, but he was one of the elders of Ephesus. He was one of the pillars in the church. Now, he, he is coming to a very boisterous church, and we are familiar with the Corinthian church by now. Divisions, fights, offenses, people taking others to court in the church, and marriages breaking apart, and looks and sounds so much like the Lighthouse Church, right? doesn't it? Can you imagine Timothy coming here, a timid guy, and getting bulldozed by our behavior? Lord have mercy, yes. <laughs> so Paul is pleading with the Corinthians, please don't show your true colors to Timothy. Treat him gently and send him on his way in peace. Another interesting thing happens, Apollos. Apollos is a very charismatic preacher, a very popular figure. He was very popular in Corinth. You know, Corinthians, they loved flashy and they, they loved the show and they loved uh, being moved emotionally. And Apollos was a kind of preacher that could, that could just, you know, catch everybody's attention and hold them in full attention. Something interesting is happening here. Apollos says, Paul is asking Apollos to go to Corinth and Apollos is not going. You know why? Because Apollos, the Corinthians, some of them said, we follow Apollos, we follow Peter, we follow Paul. And Paul says at the beginning of Corinthians, you foolish Corinthians, did Paul die for you? 
you know, I have a responsibility towards the congregation, this congregation. Today I'm here, tomorrow I may not be here, somebody else will hear. Uh, that is not relevant. I am not relevant. Nor anyone who was my predecessor, nor anyone who will be my successor. Because I am a brother in the Lord with you, growing in the same grace as you are growing. So it doesn't matter who comes on the pulpit. This is just a call where God is asking us to minister to fulfill the responsibility that he has given us. So do not, please, do not give me your loyalty. I don't want your loyalty. Do not give anybody, human beings, your loyalty. Your loyalty should be to Jesus and to Jesus alone. Absolutely. We praise God and we thank God for every servant of the Lord he has raised. We thank God for Pastor Jerry Zanstra for the years of service. We thank God that he died a beautiful death and he's, he's enjoying his rest. But our loyalty is not to Jerry Zanstra, it's to Jesus. Our loyalty is not to Pastor Warren, not to Dave Peacock, not to Pastor General Goldberg, not to me. We are only servants fulfilling our call. We are just signposts pointing you to Jesus. And you are signposts to me pointing me to Jesus. Our loyalty is secondary to the loyalty that we will give to Jesus. He is the Lord. He is the one who owns the church. He is the Lord. He is the master. He is the king. We are subject to him. So we praise God for every servant of God and for the value that they have added into the, our lives. But our loyalty is to Jesus and to Jesus alone. And so Apollos refused to go to Corinth because he did not want to become a cause of division in a church which is already divided. By him going there, it will only flame up. Already the Apollos fans club will become now on the rise and, you know, they'll be jeering in the, on the others. Wise man, Apollos, wise man. See, we all, as servants of God, are fellow workers. We are not rivals. We are not in competition. Verses 13 to 14. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. To stand firm means be stable. Be firm. Be steadfast. Be rooted on the word of God. Not on your emotions. And that's why Christians are falling at the slightest opposition or challenge that comes their way, getting offended because there's no stability in your ground. Your stability is based on your carnal nature. Your stability is not based on surrender to the Holy Spirit, not based on the Word of God. Be stable. Be mature. Grow up. Strength is always derived from God. It is in the presence of God. It is upon waiting on Him. It is upon obeying Him. It is upon surrendering to Him that actually maturity happens in your life and strength develops in your life. And he says, no other motive than love. Love is a very misunderstood word. We think love means just accepting anything and everything. No. Jesus, when, he, when, when they brought that adulterous woman to him. You saw how Jesus dealt with that woman? A lot of gentleness. A lot of patience. Why? Because that woman did not know the difference between her left hand and her right hand. That was an expression of love. Another woman came to Jesus and said, Oh, son of David, have mercy. He says to her, Can I take the bread of the children and toss it to the dogs? He called her a dog. Can you believe that? Now, was that an act of love or not? It was. Why? Because before Jesus could minister to the need with which she came, he had to minister to the lie in her life. She was a hypocrite. She was a woman from Lebanon, a Greek woman of, of Greek origin, but she is coming addressing Jesus as, oh, Son of David, she's pretending to be a Jew and trying to claim a right that as a Jew, I have the right for you to minister to me. And so Jesus had to first put her in a place and recognize her hypocrisy first before he could minister to her. That was an act of love. When Peter said, Jesus, you are the Son of God, to whom shall we go other than you? 
Jesus said, well done, Peter. That's a revelation that has come from the Father. But a, a little moment later, when Jesus talked about his death, Peter said, no, we're not going to let it happen. Says Peter, Satan, get thee behind me. He calls Peter Satan. Can you imagine that? Now, is that an act of love? It's the same God, the same love, but has different expressions for different scenarios as the need is. Do you think Jesus hated the Pharisees when he said, oh, you tomb, whitewashed tomb filled with dead men's bones? That was love because he wants them to come off from the hypocritical way and to turn to the righteous way of humility. That was love. So we, we have a misunderstanding of love and we take that verse that says love covers over a multitude of sin and we think that we just sweep things and we just ignore things, we just accept garbage. No, that's not what it means. If I am walking in error, if my brother Elma loves me, he will come and stand up on my face and say, Pastor Sherry, can we discuss? I think there is something to be discussed here. Now, if I heed to his correction, his love that came and confronted me will save me from the multitude of sins that I would have otherwise walked into and destroyed my life. That was love. So everything needs to be done in love with one motive that you and I get built up to become like Jesus. That's the motive. Verses 15 to 18. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I urge you brothers to submit to such as these and everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus and Achaius arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. These are models, not fashion models. These are models of godly living. Take attention of such people and get close with them. Avoid people that have poison in their heart because you will catch their poison. Who are always talking ill, always agitated, always angry. We, we, we meditated on that from the book of 1 Corinthians. Bad company corrupts. Good behavior. Yeah, there are some people you have to keep distance from. And you need to hold on when you see the fruit of the Spirit operating. You need to take hold, pay attention of such. And you know, the people, such people bring so much of refreshment into our lives. Because they are willing to correct us. They are willing to love us. They are willing to stand with us. They are willing to go the extra mile with us. They are willing to shake us when we need a shaking. They are willing to rebuke us when we need a rebuke. And they are willing to cry with us when we cry, laugh with us when we laugh. Such people are refreshing. And I pray each one of us comes to that place. Verses 19 to 24, final greetings. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be upon him. Come, O Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Two wonderful friends, Aquila and Priscilla. Wonderful couple. Their home was a home of nurturing. Actually, Apollos got mentored by Aquila and Priscilla. Close friends of Paul, strong pillars in the church, blessing to many. They brought many people under their wings, nurtured them, mentored them, trained them. Their home was a place of salvation. Their home was a place of prayer, of the study of the word, of discussion of God's word. Their home was a place of mentoring, of discipleship, of healing. And we cannot have such a home if a marriage is not strong and it's not godly. 
It's when a husband and wife walk together in partnership in a healthy marriage that that home becomes a place of nurturing and discipleship. And I pray that every marriage that is represented here will become like that of Aquila and Priscilla so that you nurture godly offsprings. You disciple people so that they become like Jesus. He says, give a holy kiss. What is he talking about? He's talking about affection among believers. There has to be affection among believers. You have to recognize the body of Christ. You cannot worship God while you have anger in your heart towards your brother and sister. That anger is murder. God cannot bless it. God cannot walk with you. He will leave you in the way of the path of your rebellion. And if you don't recognize that you're walking down that path of destruction, what will happen is you will continue to sear your conscience and become callous and you will think you're walking on the path of righteousness while you're actually on the path of destruction and you don't even feel it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has stopped speaking to you. You can't hear his voice. Paul says, greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, you know, in the days of coronavirus and all that, maybe the style has to change. You know, maybe you have to stand 20 meters apart and <laughs> something like that, you know. No, but what it actually means is that there has to be affection, godly affection, care for each other's. Now, Paul uses a very strong word here. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be upon him. Come, O Lord Jesus. Can we, can we pray against people? Can we curse people as Christians? What, what's Paul talking about here? Now, please don't misunderstand this verse and don't go out from here thinking that you can go and start praying against people. No. Paul has in mind John chapter 3 verse 18. He's actually talking of the status of people. John chapter 3 verse 18 says, Whoever believes in him, that is Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever, whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So this is actually a word of exhortation and warning from Paul that if you don't believe in Jesus, you are standing in the place of condemnation. He's not cursing. He's not wishing that people would get destroyed in their faith. No, that's not what it means over here. What it means over here, it's a warning to the church. It's a warning to the people that if you don't believe in Jesus, you are condemning yourself. You are standing in the place of condemnation. And then he says, come. O oh Lord, Maranatha. And that should be our prayer, that Jesus comes soon. But in the meantime, in the meantime, Jesus expects us to grow and become like him and to witness for him. He needs you and I to be daily proclaimers of the word of God. Paul closes a very hard letter of discipline in a reassurance of love. Very hard letter, very hard hitting. And I know that some of you have sensed that what has come from the pulpit is very hard hitting. And, but let me tell you this as a confession in the sight of God. Whatever has been preached from here has come in the same spirit. It is not out of spite. It is not out of condemnation. But it comes from a heart of desire to see each one of us growing in the character of Christ. And I want to say openly, I love you. And I want to assure you, I pray for you every day. And whatever hard words have come from here have not come from spite and anger, neither desiring wrong things in your life, but desiring correction, training in righteousness, formation of the character of Christ in you. So let me tell you as we close this book of 1 Corinthians, I love you, I pray for you daily, and that's my commitment. And that's what the Holy Spirit reminds me to do. And that's what we need to do for each other. I want us to stand up together in, as we close this portion. I want us to go to a verse, which is a key verse in the book of 1 Corinthians, which is the purpose statement of Paul and this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 the very first chapter in verse 2 
To the church, shall we read that together, please? To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. I want to highlight that portion, which is the key. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. And this is the whole intent of the book of 1 Corinthians. The whole intent of discipline, correction, is so that you and I become holy as the God who called us is holy. And that holy God demands. He doesn't request. He demands holiness from our lives. He demands the character of his son Jesus to be formed in you and in me. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for teaching us through this very hard letter which has brought life to us. Though there has been rebuke, though there has been correction, but this all motivated in love brings life into us. And Father, we remember at this time that the son, if we are sons, we will be disciplined. Because there is no father who loves his son who does not discipline his son. Help us, Lord, to receive this discipline with humility and with a humble heart. And I pray that, Lord, we will come to that place where we pledge allegiance to you and to you alone, not raising up man over man, not focusing on offenses, but focusing on what your love demands of us. Help us, Lord, to be holy as you are holy. And this we pray in Jesus' powerful, precious, and matchless name. And all of God's people said,